Um, as uh, as uh, the advertising said, the band director's guide to the clarinet, everything you've wanted to know about teaching the clarinet in one hour, that is a great deal. We were not going to touch on everything, but we we're going to do our darndest. So let's go ahead and get started. So the two things that we're going to talk about the most throughout, and I'm going to kind of come back to this a lot, is this idea of vibration. And um, we're going to want to promote things that help the idea of vibration, getting that reed to vibrate. And we're going to uh, eliminate things that are getting in the way of that vibration. Also, something that I've been using in my teaching for quite a while is this idea of efficiency, um, essentially getting the most out of, oops, I already went away. Um, okay, everything's happening so fast. Sorry, this is my first time being on Zoom. Here we go. Um, efficiency, it's been a year. Um, uh, with efficiency, so getting the biggest um, output with the least amount of effort, really in terms of hand position as well as air. So um, with air, I'm sure we've all done all sorts of clinics on air, especially with brass playing. And so whatever you guys use for getting the most air in, I don't really do anything different in terms of clarinet playing. I like the idea of when before you play any note, we let all of our air out, and then we take a breath in. A lot of times people always forget for that exhale before they take a big breath in. Anything that you talk about, you know, breathing in from the bottom, all of that is going to be very beneficial for, uh, for clarinet playing. The one thing that I have found to be fairly successful, and I'm on a bench, so this works out very well, is this idea of um, engaging that, uh, engaging your core when you play and having more support. So support is more than just, you know, blowing a lot of air through the instrument, but having this idea of kind of constant back pressure going into the clarinet. So if you have a student that's not projecting very well or they're not putting a lot of air through the horn something i have to do is you sit back in a chair not against the back but like on the side you lean back and put your feet in the air this is sort of where pilates and the clarinet mix and then you're going to have them support the sound play any sort of scale and you're going to have a much better connection because you're going to have that support um i always like to put my hand right behind their head so they don't fall down depending on the core strength of some of these students but uh what we're essentially doing is we're initiating those intercostal muscles as much as we can and so that's extremely helpful for um for a lot of these students so just a couple body basics um that we're not gonna spend a ton of time on uh when it comes to posture any sort of posture that you guys have talked about in the past i'm in i'm on board with i always talk about uh having four things in line whether you're sitting or standing um <clears throat> head shoulders not knees and toes but rib cage and hips so as long as those four things whether you're sitting or standing um as long as those four things are in line and we have um a very you know tension free sort of posture and stance that seems to be the best uh for posture for hand position, so imagine your hand off to the side of your hand, we're going to relax it. Our fingers are curved naturally. And so what happens is the clarinet was designed for all of your fingers to go right exactly where they need to be uh, when the hand is curved. Um, and because of this, our, our, our middle finger and ring finger kind of hit where the thumb is. So if you were to make crab claws, um, they're going to hit right about here. And so the issue with a lot of students, especially when they're younger, is having this, if we can see this, having your thumb rest right in the middle. Now the way humans were designed, we have a knuckle here, we have a knuckle here, and we have this great divot right here that's the perfect size of a thumb rest. Uh, the only downside is that if we were to put it here, our other fingers are going to want to be here, and then when they use their fingers, then we get these really angly fingers. So this thumb needs to really be a little bit closer. The thumb rest needs to be kind of on that first knuckle between the nail and the knuckle. That's very, very helpful for the right hand position. Um, and then when we move this hand, um, we're really moving from this knuckle right here, not any of these other knuckles, any sort of like motion here. It really has to do with this knuckle right here. So when they move the fingers, we move it up, this idea of efficiency. We're gonna move it up, then we're gonna move it right back without this uh, excessive finger motion, keeping that a little bit closer to the clarinet. Something that I tell students is imagine, uh, at least for the, 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 the holes for one, two, three, and one, two, three, is imagine there's a laser sticking out of there. And when you cover the hole, you're covering the laser. But also when you lift your finger, you still need to cover that laser, even though your finger's not, you know, covering the hole. So you still have to be above the hole instead of over here. So more efficiency with the hand position as well. For the left hand thumb, <clears throat> if we're at this angle, it's a little weird. This angle, physically impossible to play the clarinet. 
So it's a great uh, 45 degree angle for this left hand thumb. They make this giant key for the register key right here, and yet if you were to look closely on my clarinet, you can see where the where the kind of the, the nickel plating is starting to go away. That's really the only part that I touch. It's a very small amount, a fraction of the entire size of the key that I'm actually using. So um, when you're in front of an ensemble, um, double check those thumb positions, um, and specifically in the right hand, because that's where we see the most issues. Um, and then keeping those fingers curved. If we can do that at a young age, it really helps when they get older. Oops. There we go. So embouchure. When we do talk about embouchure with, uh, with the younger students, I like to do a two-step process in the beginning. I have them say E first. This kind of foreshadows what we're going to talk about later in terms of, um, of voicing. So we say E with the tongue, E, and then U with the corners. And so what this does is this is going to allow uh, equal pressure all the way through. So I have this fantastic little embouchure cam. I don't even know if it's going to work. I can't even tell. Can you guys tell? It's hard to tell. I can't see myself. I assume I'm here. It is working, Corey. We can it working? See Beautiful. <laughs> so, excellent. Oh, God. Okay. So what we have here is uh, with, the, with the straw technique, Bring your corners in. And what that's gonna do is that's going to, sorry, what that's gonna do is that's gonna have a, a fairly flat chin right here. We wanna think of this as being a flat chin, not necessarily a squishy chin. So when we have this, ooh, so we say e, ooh, <laughs> and then we have this space right here. And what we don't want is, and what's very common is for the, uh, for the chin to get really here. And we have a lot of skin touching the back of the reed. Hmm. So we want to make sure that we're doing is keeping ooh in here. So looking at that full front, wait for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it went away. Oh, yeah, that's right. I can't see myself. Okay. Oh my lord. <clears throat> so having it here, hmm, um, is going to help a lot. And when we use a straw, also only use bamboo straws. It's better for the environment. But what we do is uh, we're gonna have equal pressure all the way around. If we look at this drawing of lips here in the bottom right hand corner, this idea of bringing all three down or thinking of it as a triangle between the two corners and the chin, there's a lot of different ways you can talk about it or think about it, but that seems to be very helpful with the clarinet embouchure. <coughs> when you're in front of an ensemble, I found it's really, uh, it's nicer to look at it from the side so that you can see that profile. Um, and see what that looks like, and then try to minimize as much movement as possible. Um, another thing that I've done is when they're playing, taking two fingers and just kind of going back and forth, and if they don't have a lot of embouchure pressure with the corners, then it's gonna move around. And you're not gonna wanna do it really, that's why I said only two fingers, just to test um, how, much that, uh, how much that's gonna move. Uh, another thing uh, with, with this idea of the embouchure in, and with the chin pointing down, the whole point of that is getting rid of the pressure on the back of the reed. So when we have this here, and we have too much skin touching, we have a much more clearer sound, even though it's on a barrel mouthpiece, a much more clear sound when we allow that reed to vibrate. Um, another nice little trick is being able to get a concert F sharp on just the barrel and the mouthpiece. It can be plus or minus a little bit, but what happens is if their tongue is too low, ah, or if they don't have enough embouchure pressure, then they're going to be very, very flat. So when you get into that right, you know, plus or minus 10, uh, 10 or 15 cents on a concert F sharp with just the barrel mouthpiece, that's going to put them in a, a nice, uh, a, a, or it's going to be a little bit closer than with the entire instrument. And it's also a good place to start and doing some things with um, articulation, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, <clears throat> so for uh, a better version, a paler version than myself, um, essentially the same exact idea. When we were looking at this from the side, that same uh, pointed chin, getting the skin away from the reed um, there as well as here. Um, help, I found it to be very helpful looking at students from the side thinking of this as being a more pointed chin versus a collapsed chin. Okay, the tongue. 
So the great thing about PowerPoint is there's these little buttons that you can click for suggestions. And this idea of suggestions, this thing popped right up, and that is a cute dog with an adorable little head. So, okay, so one of the big things uh, about clarinet playing um, has to do with the tongue. Um, and it has to do with voicing or tongue position, and then of course articulation. So something that I um, uh, have been a big advocate about is how do we talk to students about voicing and how can we introduce it at a fairly young age? I, I, I talk about voicing uh, with every level of students and I've had success at you know, the grad student level as well as fifth and sixth graders who are first starting. So voicing I think should be talked about. We don't have to go in super depth at a young age, but um, I find it to be extremely helpful to have them talk about voicing um, on day one. So that's what we do when we say E. So everyone together, we're all gonna say E. So say E, there we go. Now when we say E, can you feel your top back molars with the sides of your tongue? E. Now that is where we want the tongue to kind of park and stay there for um, pretty much all of clarinet playing. Um, I found that with a lot of students, that little drawing at the bottom, on both of those, that top, that top curve is the roof of the mouth. And what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to funnel that air. We're trying to create uh, what we want is fast, cold air on the clarinet. The second we have an ah voicing, or if we have a low tongue in the mouth, then we get slower, warmer air. We don't get as much of a focused sound. There's a handful of things that, uh, that go wrong with tone when we talk about voicing. So to experiment with this, we have ah. Besides the fact that the pitch is very unstable, it's a very unfocused tone. It's flat in pitch, but also flat in, in timbre. So here, so then we have a much clearer sound, and that clear sound is what I like to call the diamond of a uh, clarinet tone. And when we talk about the diamond of the clarinet tone, we're talking about, you know, that pure, that pure clarinet tone and not the airiness or the fuzziness around the sound. Because it's that pure clarinet tone that is going to project to the back of the hall or in the, in the back of the ensemble that you're, that you're teaching in. So when, when people come to me and they're like, oh, I have all these clarinet players, but I can't, pl I can't hear them, usually has to do either their setup is set up in a way where um, there's just too much muffling of the reed, they're not using enough air, or in a lot of cases, we just don't have a very good diamond of the sound. So that's something that I talk with students at at all ages um, in order for them to get um, and have a little bit help, a little bit help there. So what I found happens a lot in a lot of programs is um, some band directors, uh, because with all other instruments, like all the brass instruments and flute, it's all about having this you know, large oral cavity, you know, so we say things like drop the jaw because it helps all brass playing to have a nice warm sound. And so I'm convinced that um, when we, when, when band directors hear clarinet players and they think that they sound bright, usually when people use the term bright, I, I try not to use bright and dark for, for talking about tone because I, I remember being, I remember being with a bunch of clarinetists once and we were listening to somebody play and half of them are like, oh, what a beautiful dark sound. And the other half was like, that's such a bright sound. And I remember thinking, we're listening to the same clarinet player. Why are we so different in how we're talking about, about tone? So I like to think about clarinet tone as being um, focused, centered, and uh, resonant. That's kind of the words that I like to, or the, what I like to use for descriptors for clarinet tone. And so what happens is in a large ensemble situation, you know, we're like, clarinets, we need you, we need to have a nice dark sound, drop the jaw, here we go. And the clarinets are like, gotcha, boss. And they go and they go, and the band director's like, oh my God, that's so bright and spread. I can't do it. Can't do it. Not going to do it. Clarinets, no, 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 no. You're so bright. Can we darken the sound? And they're like, oh, we're going to do anything you ask for. <laughs> and then they keep playing and it's just like a, a vicious cycle. So when we talk about words like that, you know, drop the jaw, warm, slow air, totally fine. And then just say, except for you, clarinets, don't listen to that. We're gonna make sure that we have fast, cold air, keep that tongue a little bit higher in the mouth so that we have a better focused sound and a better projection sound. Um, I have a great way of thinking of different ways of, um, 
of, of voicing. It might be a little too in the weeds for a presentation like this. So if you do have any questions about specific ideas for voicing, I got a great system that works very well that we can, if we have time, we can talk about that. Okay, so besides the tongue being uh, high in the mouth and having a lot to do with tone, specifically in the different registers, um, we want to talk about articulation because that's the second part that the tongue does. And with articulation, I found that a lot of students are very good at tricking us as teachers um, with articulation. There's a lot of ways that people can get around it because they hear tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed, but darn it if we're not good at knowing what that is when we put the clarinet in the mouth. So um, a couple things about articulation real quick. Um, one is that air is what creates vibration and it what, it's what creates tone. So again, we want to increase vibration and decrease things that get rid of vibration. So if we're going to increase vibration, we can't talk about uh, the tongue and articulation without being very clear that the air that we use um, needs to be, uh, we need to have solid air, a good air stream and a solid support system when it comes to the air production. Because without that, we just don't get any sort of uh, good final product. So um, with anything with articulation, I found that a lot of students um, you know, the second we're like, okay, now can we have less tongue? And they go, you're like, okay, less tongue. And they go, well, for some reason, we're very good at calling dynamics and tongue. Like they're very interchanged in the, in the brain. Also, there's another type of student. I call them the tongue blinkers. And I say, now repeat after me. And they go, and for some reason, their blinking setup is identical to their articulation setup. And I don't know why, but I'd love to talk to some sort of doctor and figure out how those lines got crossed. Um, so all the tongue really is doing is briefly stopping the vibration of the reed, but it doesn't stop the air. So as we're going through this little box over here in the corner, where'd it go? Here we go. So for this first one, this is very common in younger students as well. Those are four separate puffs of air where the air starts and stops and starts and stops. And so what we want to do is uh, develop a, a very clean and nice legato tongue stroke. So we're going to keep the air constant and all you're going to do is lightly touch the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. Um, and we'll talk about where that is in a moment, but okay. So the air doesn't stop. All the tongue is doing is stopping the vibration of the reed for a split second. Okay, so figuring out where the tip of the, we all heard tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed many, many times. Um, so let's figure out where is the tip of the tongue. So uh, take a fingernail, any fingernail, in COVID times, the clean one. And then touch the tip of your tongue right here. And by actually digging in that fingernail to the tip of your tongue, you're telling your tongue, this is the tip, right? So hit it right now, and then you take that, and you find the tip of the reed. So if here is the reed. If I were to draw a line from where the reed starts to curve, Right? I don't want my tongue venturing south of that line. I want everything to be the top, uh, to be north of that. So really, when, when I talk to my students about articulation, if here's the top of the reed and here's the tip of the reed, really what we're talking about is the tip of the top of the reed. So this little spot right here at the very tip. And again, this idea of minimizing anything that inhibits vibration we're gonna to want a to tongue fairly lightly. So if we take the, our finger and touch right here at the tip of the tongue, and then find that spot on the tip of the top of the reed, right there. It's gonna be much easier for us to find what, what that actually feels like. Because a lot of times we'll do that and the students will be like, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm using the tip of the tongue, but our tongue is like, let's say that big. So what we're calling the tip is the very tip. And what they're calling the tip could be the tip 20%, 25%. Like they could be using a big chunk of that tip. So that is a very helpful, uh, helpful thing is to actually use your fingernail or anything and really cut the tip of the tongue so that they know. Yeah. Where that goes. So then have them play an open G, and what we're going to do is uh, you're going to take the tongue and you're going to initiate the air, you're going to keep that support going, and then you're going to lightly touch the tip of the tongue to the tip of the top of the reed, right here, and you're going to just muffle that reed. So it sounds like this. You can still hear that tone, that 
pitch that's happening when I'm just muffling the tip. And what that does is that helps them create a light touch because it's very easy to, it's very easy to just slam that, that's loud, really just slam that tongue on the reed and get rid of all vibration. But by having that muffle still be there, you can then create the, essentially the essence of a light tongue stroke. And so that's a great example that I've had with a lot of students. Another thing that I want to, to help you guys, or something that's helped me a lot, when, before I had an iPhone, I had um, an app called Pitch Lab, and it was fantastic. It had this great app, and you could see the pitch on like a larger scale. I got an iPhone, and so we have something a little bit different. So can we see this? Hold on. There we go. So another thing that we can do is if you find... This is the, oh gosh, what app is this? TE Tuner, there's a better name for it. That's the one a lot of, a lot of students are using this. And if you use the amp analysis portion. So what happens here, I wonder if I can look at this and at the same time. So you can take your barrel mouthpiece and what you're gonna do is you're essentially going to um, watch here. And for this, the pitch isn't necessarily important, but the articulation, when they articulate, does it, does it scoop? So here is just a pitch. See how that doesn't move a lot? And then sometimes you'll have students that'll get. And they'll get that slight scoop. Now that was a fairly dramatic scoop. But for some reason, when I show this to students and they can see the scoop, sometimes it's hard for students to hear it. Um, when they can see it, because sometimes it's, it's, the pitch is very minimal. Um, but when they can see it, then they're like, oh, I'm getting a big scoop in the pitch, and they want to keep that a little bit more, uh, a little bit more high and solid. So it's a great uh, technique if you have, maybe you have a different tuner that has a different type of app, essentially something that's kind of like this that shows um, the overall level. And you can see the difference between okay, you can see the difference between all of the the thing uh, the the scoops and the non scoops. So I found that to be extremely helpful for a lot of students that I've worked with because it adds a visual element and they get to use their phones. So um, uh, something to to think about and to maybe work towards. Ooh, one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> Take that, Winston Churchill. The difference, the distance the tongue should travel is probably no more than a quarter of the distance involved in the blinking of an eye. Reginald Kell. So when we talk about where the tongue, if this is the reed and here's the tongue, we talk about how far the tongue actually moves in the, in the mouth. It's very, very small. So that example that I just showed with the scooping, that's usually the student's... Um, uh, moving too much or really moving the middle of that tongue or the jaw pressure uh, or the pressure on the back of the reed that's going to cause that scoop or their tongue significantly too far um, on the back of the reed. So a couple things to look for, okay? I'm going to use this aperture can one more time. Really wish I could see it, but that's okay. All right, I assume you can see me. So here, what we have is something that you can look for is if I'm going to tongue, instead of the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed, if I'm going to tongue down here, we see motion here. If we see motion here, we don't want to see any motion. We don't have any motion here. So if you do see motion here, chances are they're using that middle of the tongue. And another area is if they're moving the entire tongue, you're going to see motion down here. Because your tip of your tongue, it ends here, but it starts somewhere back in the throat. So, so if you see motion down here, <clears throat> it's actually hard to do. Uh, if you see motion down here, then they're moving the entire tongue. And that's a fairly big red flag that we want to kind of be aware of. Okay, so um, let's talk about this real quick. So if everyone could say D, 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 for me, go ahead, D, 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 D. What part of the tongue moves? For me, when I say D, 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 I think a lot of people, um, we're gonna see just that tip of the tongue that moves. And when it does move, D, D, oh, I can't uh, D, 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 and it's not D, ah, E, ah, E, ah. Because when you say E, ah, E, ah, everyone try that, 
e ya e ya you can feel that middle part middle back part of the tongue go from being very high to very low yes so when we are tonguing uh we want to make sure that it is really just the tip of the the tongue that is doing the motion and so anything in the back is going to manipulate pitch it's going to make our sound unfocused it's going to cause a whole bunch of issues so when we are articulating oops, when we are articulating that we have a constant airstream, small amount of tongue touching the tip of the tongue to the tip of the top of the reed, and it's really just the front part of the tongue that's, that's moving. Any motion in the throat is usually the entire tongue moving. Um, uh, a harsh sounding articulation is usually, um, so if you look at the clarinet reed to the mouthpiece, and we have a, a, a drawing in a second, but it's a, it's a very small opening. So if we hear this, that sort of sound that we've all heard a thousand times, it's usually the reed going all the way into the black part of the mouthpiece and then kind of coming back that way. Usually your, your tongue is going to be very much um, in tr uh, just using way too much tongue touching the, the, the entire part of the reed. Another thing is I was doing a master class at a university and here's the thing about students in general is they're very good at tricking us. And so he got really good at, um, at coughing notes out. So, and, and you know, I went in and the professor's like, I have used every tool in my toolbox. I don't know, I, I don't know what to do with his articulation. Cause it sat, and I heard him play, he's playing, he's playing Mendelssohn's Scherzo from Midsummer Night's Dream. And he was playing, he could only, you know, get to a certain tempo and then he plateaued. And I was like, are you touching the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed? He's like, I am, you know, how students lie. And I was like, okay. And I was like, let's, let's hear it. And he went, and he was kind of doing like separate puffs of air. And I was like, interesting. And he got really good at coughing notes out. And I saw a little bit of motion here. And I was like, cause then what happens is like your, your throat is going like, and it's like tongue in the back. I don't know how you do it, but he got really good at getting it to what I would say is a fine tempo, but he couldn't do it high. He couldn't do it that fast. And so, um, you know, we got him using the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. And that fingernail thing is very helpful because a lot of times people will, will do that or they'll put their tip of the tongue on the bottom tooth, kind of in preparation for that anchor tonguing type thing. And um, so they think that they're using it, but they're just not 100% aware. So that's the other thing I found with articulation is just having people be more aware because you can't see inside my mouth, I can't see inside your mouth. And so that becomes very tricky as educators and as students. And so we have to come up with things like different syllables or pictures and different ways to kind of describe what's happening on the inside of the mouth. Mm. So uh, starting a note, I, um, I've had a ton of students, uh, I've had a ton of students have issues with this idea of starting notes. So um, uh, let's, let's talk about it. So with this method, um, it helps in order for us to start any note, any dynamic, um, any range of the clarinet. So, and I find that a lot of people will do this in an opposite order. So what I do is I take these six steps and I put them on three by five cards and I tell the students to put them in the order that they think is the correct order. And then, um, and then we try it and then we put them in the order that you see and then we try that. So, Step number one, forming the embouchure. Ooh, we're gonna say E, get the tongue high, and then ooh with the embouchure, right? Tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed, lightly. This is on the outside. We haven't even put the clarinet in the mouth yet. So ooh, mm, and then the comes in the mouth. We're gonna breathe in through the corners. We're gonna expel the air. Now my tongue is still touching the reed. So without step six, we get this. The second that step six comes into play, we are releasing that tongue from the reed. This way, we essentially have two different schools of thought with starting notes. You can start with the air and the air kind of balloons out and goes and we get that sort of a, a, an attack or we get um, a very specific da, right? So I like to talk uh, to students about starting and stopping notes kind of analogous to how a painter 
is going to do a brush stroke. So if we're looking at this beautiful painting behind me, isn't that gorgeous? Four feet by six feet. I had to make a box to move it. It was ridiculous. So if you were gonna take a paintbrush, and if this were a large blank canvas, at one point there's no art on there. And so when you have the paint on the brush, you then have to be very cognizant and aware of how that first brush stroke is going to, to look. It's not just gonna be like, and there's a house, right? You have to make sure that you know exactly where you're starting. And then also like, how are you gonna finish that? And so when we talk about the release of notes, it's kind of similar. So I like talking about starting and ending notes in terms of brush strokes, because I'm a, visual, I'm a very visual learner and I found that helps with a lot of students. So with this, what we're doing is we're giving a very precise, here is that first, here is that first note. And the tongue is essentially saying, now. Okay, now the key to this is touching the, especially when we get up into the higher, uh, in the higher clarion and upper altissimo, is that when you release that tongue, first of all, you have to touch the reed very, very lightly, like we talked about before. And when you release the tongue, you have to release the tongue in that E position. If we do, and we've heard this a lot, I'm gonna start on a clarion G. So, in this register, it's a very common first clarinet to get. The little undertone, that clarinet grunt that we all love so much. So with this, if we have the tip of the tongue touching the tip of the reed, you can hear a little bit of air before I play. Right? So that your air is set. And when you get better at it, you can... And that amount of air, you can diminish that time. But we want to have the air set behind the reed before we release the tongue. Okay, so another thing that's extremely helpful that I have found is having students just start with no tongue, just a solid brick of air. Now it's not, rather it's, they start with a, like a, like a, like a, a wall of air. Because the difference between and with the tongue is very different. In both cases, the air is there. Uh, the air is the most important part of that. So keeping in mind that when we're starting these notes, it's that release of the tongue after the air is um, after the air is behind the reed. In fact, five and six are most commonly um, switched. They will release the tongue and then the air. And that's when we get we get sort of that. And then yes, repeat it a million times. Corey, we have a quick question from the chat. If you have a moment. I love questions. Yes, let's hear it. Um, the question in the chat asks, have you ever had anyone tongue over the tip of the reed? And in, if you have, what did you do with that student? Oh, meaning like tongue up here? I think that's what they mean, yes. Ouch. That's uncomfortable. Um, I, I, that fingernail method is what I would probably recommend. If they're, if they're again, students, I mean, students are really trying to please you. They're trying to do the right thing. So when you say, you know, tip of the tongue, tip of the reed, they're like, got it. And like, a, you know, a new puppy, they don't have good motor skills of that tongue yet. So they might be overshooting. Um, or um, if, uh, if they're trying to articulate like a flute, like a doo 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 doo, or like literally saying d d d d d where the tip of the tongue is touching that, that uh, the, the roof of the mouth, they could be doing that. So have them on the outside of the clarinet, and then and then bring it in, and then have them release that way. And then try that muffled system that I talked about earlier with that way. Most of the time, if they're tonguing in a weird spot in the mouth, it's because they don't know what it feels like of here, to here, and then out. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell students to tongue a G a couple times, and then I'll say, and then when I point to them, I'll say freeze. And then wherever their tongue is, they have to freeze. And then they take the clarinet out of the mouth and they keep their tongue like attached to it. And then that's a good way of knowing exactly where that tongue is. All right, so that might help as well. I did have one teacher at one point, he would draw sh oh, the Sharpie marker all over the tip of the reed. And then you would tongue and then you could see in a mirror what like where exactly on the on the tongue the tip of the reed is touching and then you taste it sharpie the rest of your day and i'm 90 percent sure that's child abuse so we're not going to do that it's quite disgusting but uh try that i think that might help did i answer the question 
Yes, and we do have one other question if you have time. Of course. Um, for a teacher or student, what are good ways to teach our students to re learn repetitive staccato in middle or high school? Repetitive staccato in middle or high school. So for me, um, I'm a big advocate of, uh, we play too short overall on the clarinet. Uh, when we talk about Weber and Mozart, everyone gets very pecky. And um, we don't have to play super duper short all the time. And so I'm a big advocate of developing a legato tongue stroke first. So if you go on, um, if, if you're familiar with uh, the Langinus book, page 22, it's an articulation exercise. It's on my website, CoreyMackey.com, but also uh, it's a public domain thing. And it's the, um, it's that exercise. And um, I, I teach students to develop a legato articulation first. Because what that's going to do is that's going to create this. It's going to create the right tongue stroke uh, for the tip of the tongue to the tip of the top of the reed. And then once they get a good legato articulation, they can do that faster. And especially for like Mozart, though, it's not very it's not very very short like it's it's fairly a legato articulation so i found that that is just that right there and getting that is extremely helpful and then leaving the tongue on the reed a little bit longer is how we develop a more staccato articulation and leaving the tongue on the reed but uh focus on a legato tongue stroke first that's what i would say Thank you. And the last question that we have in the chat is how far into the mouth should you be putting or instructing a student to put the mouthpiece? Like, is there any particular place that you would yes. um, teach? And now a break for a terrible drawing. So we'll go back to the original thing, but um, uh, this is uh, one of the next things that I was going to talk about. So um, imagine, uh, this is hard to do on, on PowerPoint. Imagine this red part's the reed, yes? So if this red part's the reed, the reed and the mouthpiece are flat together, and then there's a breakaway point. If you have a clarinet in your hand, take a look at it from the side, you're gonna kind of see that breakaway point. As you can imagine, this is the part of the reed that vibrates right here. So we wanna put our lower lip um, south of here. Now if we go too far, the clarinet's going to tell us and we're going to get a squeak in there. So we want to make sure that we have enough. And I have found that depending on the student and their jaw bite, if you have an overbite versus an up and down bite, an underbite, it could change the amount of mouthpiece that you have in your mouth. So what I tell students, and more often than not, students do not have enough mouthpiece in the mouth. So if I'm only putting my bottom lip like here, right if i'm only putting it here then only part of that is vibrating so it's going to sound like i'm going to play as loud as i can if i put a little bit more in there the reed can vibrate and i have a lot more air if i go too far then the clarinet's going to get that overtone squeak so then find that squeaking spot back it off a little bit and we should be a lot closer. But I know for me, when I was a younger student, I didn't have enough mouthpiece in the mouth. And if you could imagine, it's you know about a quarter to three eighths of an inch. If I'm gonna, if you're gonna be like that, but if your if your jaw is straight up and down, opening it enough for that to come in, you're gonna allow that much to vibrate. Too much, again, we're gonna get the we're gonna get the chirp in there. And yes, you can use this drawing for all of your educational needs. Feel free. Thank you so much, Corey. Yeah, no problem. So um, let's let's go back. Hmm, not that one. There we go. So uh, going back to equipment, we're not going to get uh, super involved in brands, but I feel like you you can't talk about clarinet tone without uh, without addressing a handful of things. So when we talk about upgrades, I do think we need to upgrade in a specific order. Everyone has to buy reeds anyways. So go ahead and get um, more professional quality reeds if the student is wanting to to upgrade their sound. 
Um, next is going to be ligature, and then also how to put them on correctly. Symmetry is very important, and a student could have an amazing clarinet with a very expensive mouthpiece and ligature, and the reed could be on crooked and they're going to sound terrible. So make sure that the reed is on symmetrically. I use that for students all the time. We talk about butterfly wings, how those are symmetrical, and making sure that not only is the tip symmetrical, but this part right here where the, 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 the heel of the reed hits the table of the mouthpiece right there, we want to make sure that that is also symmetrical so that we have even vibration all the way through. Okay? Um, so in terms of ligatures, when you're a young, young student, like five or six, or fifth and sixth grade, and uh, you know that the students are droppers, those all leather ligatures are fantastic because they will survive the zombie apocalypse. They are not going to break. You can step on them, and they are great. Um, in terms of tone production, now these are all leather, not the ones that have like leather with a metal part touching the mouthpiece. But the ones that are all leather, I feel like the students are trying to talk but they're being, they're being muffled because we don't get a very solid vibration. So any of the metal ligatures that have uh, very specific contact points um, on, on, the, on the reed, I think are going to be very, very helpful. Something that you're going to get a very strong contact point um, is going to be helpful. A lot of different companies have different examples of this, but if you have a student that's playing on what I call Bob's ligature, which is just that silver one that comes standard in most clarinet cases, or that leather ligature that has nothing but leather, I would recommend um, jumping up to the next uh, one. And you don't have to spend a fortune on a ligature to get a good sound. There are plenty in that $20 and $30 range that you could get for a student, and they're going to have immediate uh, success. Um, I can't tell you how many times I would come on, uh, go to a master classes, and you know, you, you put a, a ligature on their clarinet that's new, you know, that has just those two rails, and um, they're ext it's extremely helpful because it's a lot easier for students to play uh, when the reed vibrates all the way, and they're much louder too. Like they, they project more. Um, for mouthpieces, um, I'm a big advocate of. Um, you know, the, the next step up for mouthpieces in that, you know, 100 to $120 range for most students, um, uh, that's going to be the, a, a great place for us to start. Uh, I don't think a lot of, you know, middle school, high school players need to be playing on super three to $400 mouthpieces. Um, I play on a fairly standard, simple setup, and I recommend that for a lot of students. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the instrument. But a quick thing about mouthpieces that I wanted to bring up, which is what this crude drawing is for, is that if you're younger and you have a stock mouthpiece, there usually to be an open mouthpiece where you can play on a softer reed. Now imagine this is like a size two or two and a half, and it's going to vibrate a lot. Okay. When you upgrade to a mouth, uh, a more closed mouthpiece, um, then you're going to play on a harder reed. But what happens is students will think to themselves, ah, it's very important for me to, to play on a hard read because all the best clarinet players play on hard reads, but they're still on a very open mouthpiece. So their read only vibrates from here to here, and then all of this air is going through, so they have a very airy tone. So when you upgrade your mouthpiece, upgrading to um, and having them experiment with um, a different size read, I think is extremely important so that if they were to play on their same size two and a half read, on a more closed mouthpiece, it's going to immediately close up on them. So a lot of manufacturers of mouthpieces, they'll tell you, like ballpark, what read to get with that mouthpiece. And uh, I found that a lot of students have more success with that. So when we upgrade mouthpieces, try to upgrade the size and the strength of the, the strength of the read when we do that as well. Okay, um, go back. Um, a lot of people ask me about going over the break. Um, now, I know in a band situation, if you're doing you know, standard of excellence or, or whatever book you're using, I don't want to tell everyone to use like a completely different method because it's going to be hard for us to, 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 you know, to go away from whatever book that you happen to be using. So if we can not start with long B or C, that would be fantastic. Because the issue with most clarinet players when we use the pinky, so here's your hand, here's your pinky, when you put your pinky down or you move it, that ring finger, the way that we're designed, that ring finger, they're very good friends and they always like to follow each other. So when we talk about curved fingers, when we talk about hand position, our pinkies, when we go to play this, this finger 
is going to follow, and this uh, left and right hand ring finger is a big issue for most students. Because most students are children, and they have what I like to call child-sized hands. They have very tiny hands, and it's a lot harder for them to cover the holes. So if you can tell your, your, you know, your younger students, you know, finger G, low G, one, two, three, one, two, three, and have them squeeze for a couple seconds, and then make them show you their fingers. Can you see those little circles on all the finger uh, prints? Also using the term fingerprints is very helpful um, because if, if you only see a semicircle, well, you're not covering the whole. And the clarinet is a two, and you have to go from an A, like a throat A, which you're only using this much tube, to like a B or a C, where you're using the entire tube. And so the clarinet is designed that if your fingers move quickly, and efficiently and you go right to the next thing it's going to work but what happens is if you don't cover those holes that's the biggest issue so when you have a younger student and they're trying to play you know over the break and it's you know using something in the right hand something you can do is take the back of your hand and just feel in front and feel where is the air coming out because if you're like if you can feel air right here and sometimes you can just see it because they're not even close but sometimes they're very close and so i always tell students to overshoot a little bit with the ring fingers and then using the back of your hand you can feel and you're like ah right hand third finger angle a little bit more this way and they're like oh got it and then the note pops right up so that's very helpful um for going over the break and it's usually the biggest problem with students going over the break is just not sealing the, the clarinet um, again, allowing the reed to vibrate, you got to keep the air moving as we go through. So whatever note that precedes that note going over the break, crescendo um, going over the break is going to help students as well. And then I had somebody ask uh, for resonance fingerings. For younger students, I tell, I tell people to do resonance fingerings uh, from day one because when they play an open G, um, the clarinet is very foreign to them and it might fall out of their hands. So um, for our throat tones, which are going to be G, G sharp, A and B flat, um, just put the right hand down. One, two, three, and C. Um, for all beginners, it's great. For those four notes, it gives us more stability in the embouchure because we're actually holding onto the clarinet. It'll get them used to the idea of resonance fingerings, and um, it's extremely helpful for pitch and for when you go over the break. Because if you're going from an A or a B flat to a C, if you're doing it this way, you have to add all of those fingers. But if all of those are already down, you have a much more uh, higher probability that those are going to be sealing and you're going to have a better connection as you go over that break. Okay? So uh, for younger students, just say right hand down. I wrote out all of these little diagrams, but essentially they're, they all have one, two, three, and C down for all of those guys. And if we go one over, oh! Sorry, I just found a, a website that creates your own fingering diagrams, and I took advantage. So these are some of my favorite. Now, I will say that depending on the student and the instrument and all that stuff, experiment, try different things. Um, and so if, you're, if you have uh, you know, a more advanced middle school student or a high school student, here are some that are very helpful for me. Um, in the G category, one and three or one and two, I will say this A flat right here works on almost every brand of clarinet very, very well. It's three in the left, one in the right. I absolutely love it. For A and B flat, two, three, two, three, C, it's easy because it rhymes and easy to say. And then here's a great B flat that I just love. Everybody knows about side B flat. Of course, side B flat sounds great, but we never get to use it because it's hard to go over the break. But this B flat is regular B flat, two, three, and then that C sharp key. Hear how bright it makes it and more resonant? I always tell students when it comes to the throat tones to brighten up the throat tones by having fast cold air and a high tongue so that they project a little bit more okay so I'll, I'll, I'll give everybody will have access to this uh, this slideshow when we're done so if you're frantically writing those down don't worry about it you can take a look at them um, after um, but that's actually all I have that's the entire thing so um, I just want to say thank you very much uh, to everybody at ICA on the Youth Committee, um, all the work that they do is fantastic. Uh, Dr. Davis, Shannon McDonald, uh, Jonathan Stelzer, and Karen DeBausch. Uh, my website is really easy to remember, coreymackey.com, as long as you know that my name is Corey Mackey. And on it, if you click under the, the Resources tab, I essentially made a PDF of all of these slides.
All right. Um, well, thank you again to our guest artist clinician, Dr. Corey Mackey, for giving this wonderful workshop today. Thank you also to Shannon McDonald, Karen DeBush, and Jonathan Stelter, the subcommittee that planned these marked workshops. They did an extraordinary amount of work, and we are grateful to them for that. And finally, thank you to all of you for attending.